Okay, we're live. Yeah. Trying to do too much. Oh, we don't have this. Oh, let's see. We'll wait for the next meeting. We'll do that next week. Oh, Jay, we can do it. You are now live. Okay. All right, we'll go ahead and begin. So this is strategic plan number four update, and we will actually go through a few slides and obviously stop me if you have any questions, um, and then we'll get to all the information we want to share. And I may go back and forth on the slides since uh, some of the notes are not there on the uh, screen, but not on the screen, so we'll go ahead and get that. So just a reminder that our strategic uh, priorities, the one is uh, student achievement. Of course, uh, seeing different data that we give you all the time, there's a lot of great things happening, but we always have room for improvement, and we'll continue to work on that. Uh, number two, recruitment and retention. We'll talk about that a little bit more later, some of the things that we did to get to the point where we're at. And we are close to our ADM um, uh, final count, and I will tell you that we're going to be really, really close to what we were last year. Um, and, and obviously knowing uh, a lot of different things, um, there have been a, a decline um, across the, the county and so it's good to know that we're we're back on track with that it'll be similar uh, to what our fall was our fall was yes most of we're trying to compare apples to apples of course typically we have um, an increase from fall to spring um, but it looks like we're going to be about the same uh, a lot of different scenarios with that and then of course financial uh chris does a great job with all those and you um, will Approve the budget tonight. Uh, we're recommending the, the budget there tonight, so things are looking really well there. And of course, priority number four, facilities and technology, is really what we're talking about uh, the most here. And so, provide safe and efficient learning environments. And I do want to read the measurable goal that was uh, presented uh, when we started this in 2019, and that is to optimize utilization and determine feasibility of current facilities <coughs> or other possibilities. And so, really, when that was written, we didn't really know what the other possibilities might be, um, but those are the things that we're looking at, whether it's a current facilities or other possibilities, and that's what we'll be talking about tonight also. So I want to give a little brief history. I think this is really neat, too, and if um, the people, if anybody's online watching this, we do have the pictures of all of the uh, board members on the, on the wall, and it's interesting to note that on July 1st of 1959 is when MSD became a corporation and you can see 1962 is when Southland and Northville uh, opened and you can see where all of those uh, township schools uh, came together and then of course from 1965 to 1980 uh, the four elementaries were um, built and so one thing I think we're at the, the point now where we look at okay are there other things that we can do to be more efficient and provide more opportunities for students and looking at the picture there, I know everybody can't see that if they're online. I don't know if anybody is online right now, but um, the pictures there, you can actually see um, they're around some tables. Now we don't have those chairs anymore, but we do have uh, uh, new tables and chairs, but we, we uh, up to about a year ago, we had all those chairs 60, from 62 years ago, which there's is still interesting. Right there. huh? there's still yeah, we still have a few, they're just not in this room right now. <laughs> and, and I have one in my office too, so it's really neat to have that. So. Um, but anyway, they were contemplating uh, what to do when you have Chippewa, La Fountain, La Grow, Lincolnville, Lynn Lawn, Noble Township, Rowan, Somerset, and Urbana. Um, they were contemplating, and of course then, like we said, 1962-63 uh, is the first school year uh, for Southwood Junior Senior High School and Northwood Junior Senior High School. Seems like yesterday, but nobody was necessarily in school at that time here. But, uh, <laughs> so, but they watched it. Uh, but you watched, watched it. it the door. Yeah. So, one thing we want to look at too is, and, and part of the reason for all this discussion and discussion across the state of Indiana with other schools too, is just uh, student enrollment history. And I have to explain a little bit of this. So, um, going back to 1962 63, um, being 60 years ago, um, it's almost 60 years ago, it's sometimes difficult to find all the data. But we do have little booklets um, that shows some of those um, enrollments uh, that we had back in 1976, 1977. And you can see the other dates. You, there's a date there that skipped also. You From 1980 to 1981, um, could not find that booklet, but there are um, other dates there. So there's a big gap from 1982 to 2015. 2015, 
um, is when I came to central office and then had a little bit more idea uh, through our Skyward system or through other electronic means to find out what all those numbers were. So you can see the difference from 1979 to 1980. There were 1,004 students uh, at Northfield and Southwood combined with 493 and 511, always been pretty consistent with the same amount of numbers. And then presently, um, and when I said presently, this is um, like a week ago, so it could be up or down a little bit, probably up, uh, but 509 students. So again, when you look at that, it looks pretty uh, like a huge drop from 81 to 2015, but you also notice that that's, there's a lot of years involved with that. Um, and then you can kind of compare then, if you go back and forth here, you can kind of compare that this um, is a graph that was uh, provided. Actually, I was in a Kiwanis uh, meeting that Grow Wabash County actually presented a population loss of the county. And you can see it really parallels, um, you can see 1900 all the way to 2050 is what some projections are but it kind of parallels uh, the two different graphs. But that's not necessarily our concern as much as a concern of um, what our own enrollment is and how we can make things more efficient, provide more opportunities. Also notice though, from 2010 to 2020, the last census, um, it actually, uh, we lost 1,912 uh, people in Wabash County, according to the census. So going along with what has been projected. And this is just another uh, graph that was provided by Wabash County. It really breaks it down to um, kind of the same thing you saw before, but also breaks it down by age groups um, and the number that's projected to be lost in uh, 2020 to 2050. And look, if you look at the 45 to 65 year age, um, that's the largest loss. <coughs> of course, when we're talking about large loss, unfortunately, those people probably aren't moving. Maybe some of them are going to be snowbirds to Florida, but um, other ones, um, might just be passing away. Say it that way, but that's probably good. That's part of that uh, scenario, I'm sure. Maybe they'll move quite too, who knows. Um, but that age group too, for the most part, 45 to 64, probably will not be bringing children to our schools um, at that age group either, so interesting to know. So really, you know, 62 years after the creation of MSDWC, that's where we're at right now, we want to propel MSD of Wabash County for the next 60 years and beyond, obviously. Um, so strategic plan four is, is another way of looking at it. So providing again additional opportunities for students, also facility improvements, uh, maintenance and upgrades, and also building um, use efficiency. And you know through a lot of things that Coon gives to us uh, when we talk about budgets and when we talk about uh, different things, we, we look at those numbers as far as uh, the efficiencies of our building, and the capacities uh, that are involved. And we do know that right now the capacities of uh, Southwood and Northfield, um, typically they say if we're about 80%, that means we're pretty full, but we are actually in the 50s at one of the schools and the 60s at another school. And that hasn't changed for the last few years. So. That's something that we have to look at. So it really comes down to some other things that we've looked at. So and part of this history and strategic plan is just a reminder of all the things that we've done so far. So September 2018, we had Steve Yeager, the Yeager Educational Service Corporation that came in. And if you recall, he went to all the different communities. Um, he went to all the different schools, uh, did a lot of work on just uh, talking to, to people about some different ideas. The same thing is what we're looking at as far as what, what can we do to propel, uh, propel our school district for the next 60 years plus? Um, a lot of great things happening, but we, we can't just be looking at today, we have to look at um, in the future. And so 2018 to 2000, or August of 2019, we had Nick Loy from Bright Minds Marketing. Of course, uh, with open enrollment, um, we have to look at making sure that we are telling our story, because if we don't tell our story, somebody else is gonna tell the story for us. And so that's when we uh, made some changes and have a lot of great things going along with that too. And I think uh, you would agree that, um, you know, with our hire and with all the things that are going on, um, it's, it's been a, a good improvement. So appreciate that. Deb Blackbiter, Dr. Deb Blackbiter from Butler University. She has her own um, also business. Uh, Dr. Blackbiter and Associates uh, basically came and helped us with those four strategic plans, uh, those priorities. And so all of them really are going to be continual uh, priorities that we've had. Um, but those are some 
but tonight we're going to concentrate more on strategic plan number four. So just community um, communication. One thing we went back and looked at, okay, what are all the things that we've done so far with the public? Just like this is a public, um, this is an open meeting, it's a work session. Since we only have one guest today, um, it's not a place where it's a question and answer, but it is a place that we can discuss and talk and do, do different things like that. Of course, there'll be no vote tonight uh, during this meeting. So April 17th, 2019, we had a school board work session, strategic planning. Um, two of you were not a part of that, but the rest of us were. And we actually um, were off-site. We did go to Heartland, uh, I mean, yeah, Heartland RMC to their conference room and had a very good meeting uh, with Dr. Wellfire. December 3rd through the 19th, then we presented that to our building level staff. So we went to all the different schools and did a presentation. And then if you recall on the 17th and the 27th of February, we went and took that strategic plan presentation to North Road South. Um, and that was open to the public basically going over all those priorities and other various uh, situations. And then September 20th or 22nd, 2020, um, we had a school board work session like we are tonight, with strategic plan reviewed and updated. And part of that was uh, looking at, um, you know, where we were as far as finding out about building facilities and different things like that. And if you recall, that was kind of during the COVID area too. I mean, we're still in the COVID, but it all started on March 13th of 2020, and then so we, we waited a little bit longer, and then we had that strategic or that uh, school board work section. Then October 13th is when um, Dr. Kuhn brought in, and we had policy analytics come in to look at some tax rates and AV. And then November 10th is when we actually had this, another school board work session, reviewed the strategic plan with Barton Co. Villama. And then on January 28th of 2021, another school board work session, and that's with all of you then, uh, to the two new board members. Um, one thing I don't know that we put in here, and I thought we did, but I don't see it. We actually had a, a work session where we actually took a tour of all the buildings too. That's that one. It says it. Yes, yes, sir. Tour of oh, buildings. Sorry. Yeah, there is tour of buildings. I thought it was there. Okay, thank you. Um, so anyway, that gives us a little idea of all the things. We, we've been talking about this a long time. Um, and a lot of things that have been going on uh, the last uh, two or three years. And so really tonight, uh, and this is where maybe more of the discussion. So there are studies for facility efficiencies. And really there are different studies that we've already looked at. We've looked at the retaining of all schools um, and how, what that looks like, how much it would cost to get them to the point where they would be like new. Um, the shuffling of grade levels um, over time to also uh, reduce or phase into a four or three building um, corporation and then giving a specific focus, focus on the nine through 12 uh, grade levels. Because as we know right now, and, and we've always uh, talked about a lot of times, it's, it's the nine through 12 is where um, our schools are uh, not to capacity. And so looking at that, and then of course, um, the one that we need, we haven't looked at a lot, but we need to, to do, and this is what we're going to discuss, is to build a new high school. Um, to build a 9 through 12 high school to include phasing into a three building district over time while maintaining and improving certain buildings. So, you know, I want to look back, if we look at those uh, um, board members, and I think maybe the superintendents were in some of those pictures too, and maybe even some of the, the school attorneys, uh, but I'm sure when they were um, thinking about MSD of Wabash County, they had all those schools and they were looking at what can we do to become more efficient. And I think we're at that time too, is what we can do to be more efficient. We have a great school district. We have a lot of great things going on um, in, in all the buildings, um, but we always have to look uh, to the future to see how we can keep that going and make it more efficient. And so really that is our work session for tonight. So we. We can ask questions, we can talk, but I wanted just to give you a little bit of an update um, because these are some of the things that we've been talking about um, and thinking about, uh, but we just haven't uh, made any decisions, obviously. We're not going to make any decisions tonight, but we need to continue to study. And so I think that's a key word here is studies for facility efficiencies. Um, so as much as we can, we want to look at um, uh, studying uh, certain aspects of propelling our school district um, for the next 60 years. 
there really are no other slides, so I <laughs> conclude with that part of it. So, and obviously, then we will uh, we'll go into our school board meeting at six o'clock, um, and then there'll be some recommendations. We have a this is a a very good uh, agenda because of, of course we're looking at uh, different things, but I think some great things with with the teacher contract, the tentative agreement, with the budget uh, Dr. Kuhn has put together. Um, and then, of course, uh, a, a resolution that we're going to look at. And the resolution uh, will go along with this. But here again, it's just for a study because um, you have to follow different aspects of, of any of the code to follow um, looking at studying different uh, facility efficiencies. So I'm going to stop talking for a second. So see if there's anything anybody wants to say before we conclude this part of our meeting. And no, there's not enough time for you guys to go back home and get in the fields and then come back at six o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that far away. Uh, I want to reiterate this isn't because we have financial problems, correct? Correct. Yeah, this has nothing to do with that. So, okay. Because yeah. some people will say that, but yeah. this has something to do with that because you guys have done a terrific job of getting us where we need to be. Yeah. Well, you're talking in about. In fact, that. we're as strong as we've ever been. Ever. Yeah. Efficiencies. Actually, efficiencies provide even more opportunities. I think you know there are a lot of opportunities, but if the more efficiencies that you have provide more opportunities, um, that's a good question. Let's just talk about that. So, uh, you know, financially, we are able to um, add programs, which we actually added um, another program in the high schools this year with computer science. Uh, we could add um, financially, we could add more programs for other students, but yet it, it still comes down to that um, critical mass of if you add this, what will it take away from, and will we have any students in it? So um, we've talked about that quite a bit. You know, we could add a lot of different things, um, but we would not have students to be able to be in, in those activities or in those classes or any of those types of things. So um, that's a very, very good question because uh, that is sometimes a question people ask. Well, is this because you want to save money? It's not about saving money. It's about being efficient with the money. Now, obviously, everybody... It's also, I would also say that it's also gives us an idea of how better way of how we spend our money. So right. with a direction, with a plan, yeah. we can spend our better, we can spend our money, not to say better, but we can spend it wisely, wisely. wisely. <laughs> yeah. wisely. Uh, yeah. down the road. I yeah. mean, Mike alluded to it, uh, you know, 62 years ago, there was a vision put out for MSD we just want to reevaluate that vision and see what we can do to propel us for the next 50, 60 years as MSD. And to do that, we're going to need to study some things and get a better idea of some of these impacts in the future. And I know Tim talks about programming too. It's like they're programming for our students, but because, and I'll probably just turn that over to you as far as how students are able or not able to do that because the you know, we have programming but yet can you take advantage of that programming in certain situations that we have and so yeah our current programming is as robust as any in the area but we offer courses that don't get put into the master schedule because there's just not enough kids to sign up for them and so when that happens then that reduces the number of sections we can offer of a class which then kind of locks up other parts of the schedule and again it's not for lack of funding or lack of staffing it's just Lack of students, and so finding a way to get more students in, in, into those programs unlocks all kinds of opportunities. And so, yeah, and people often ask, "Well, is to increase our programming?" Well, kind of to increase the programming, it's more just to increase up, increase the opportunity for students to take advantage of our, our programming that we currently are offering. And so we will see growth, but it'll be more so allowing students to get to classes that we offer now, but because of tight schedules, they just can't get to. So a couple of years ago, I guess it's been close to a couple of years ago, we had as many as, I believe you said, 50 sections of, of different classes that met between the two schools that had less than 10 kids. But I know this year it's still early. Do we have kind of an idea on, are we still pretty close to that? You know, I haven't read that report, so I would hate to guess, but we still have quite a few like that. And, okay. and we work very hard. And, and it's and in, in some ways you might consider it financially unwise, right? Wasteful. We work hard to offer classes if there's only one or two students. Right. Um, we still do that. Um, and so 
I don't know the exact number, but we still have that same thoughts. Well, with the enrollments, with the enrollment that we have now, compared to what you're talking about, Todd, it, it, I'm sure it has to be close to that too. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and and I will say too, other school districts, that uh, larger school districts, or not necessarily larger school districts, but the students that have larger districts that have one high school, for example, you know, a lot of times they say that if they don't have 12 students in the class, and I just, I talked to a, a chief academic officer, curriculum director, just a couple years ago, they said 12 was the number. So they didn't have 12 in that class. So you think about um, mm -hmm. that situation, you know, two years ago, or three years ago, when we said 50 classes, that means in some schools they'd say, you just lost 50 classes. Well, then what are you gonna do? So, you know, we had to offer those classes. So, you know, more efficiently, more wisely, as far as, um, you know, Providing those opportunities, right? And I classes. and I applaud our efforts. I mean, even if we have one or two people in that class, you know, to make that available to them, uh, I think is important. But I also think it's important to look at that efficiency of, you know, is there a way that we could be more efficient in those resources? Not again, not not necessarily for financial reasons, but for reasons of if we can make as you said earlier if we could make more sections go then that frees up a schedule for somebody who says well i'd like to take that class but i've got this requirement my graduation requirement class that has to be taken <coughs> this class and so i can't take that elective that i would kind of like to take so you know we're talking about if we have two or three kids <coughs> in a class so okay if you got two or three at northfield two or three at southwood you're still a six right is that is that a reality oh absolutely there are even in Chabrera schools you're, you're gonna have classes of 10 and 8 and some other classes and so um, we do we will try to make those go even at that yeah are those like advanced classes or those yeah. that, that AP um, classes they are generally AP classes but they're also your special ed classes um, we have some students, students with needs that are at different buildings and if they work together in one building um, the programming and the opportunity to give them a unique group. So it's at all levels. Um, I would say even at your general level, you still have that issue. Yeah, and, and no matter how many people you have going there, the more specialized you get, the smaller that number will get. Yeah. Will be. I mean, I took a music theory class at Ball State that had seven people on it. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of how many people are interested in that class at that time. So just, I mean, is there, are there classes that, as a, um, that department, is there classes that you think that we would offer that we don't now? Sure. I think um, uh, the ones that come to mind are your top end classes. Like we currently offer a calculus AB, which is like calculus one. Um, and we have probably 10 students, north and south of those. Um, it would be nice to offer calculus two. And that you're talking five or six kids, right? That want to do that, but um, that there would be one example. Um, our fine arts, music, and band, we've kind of gotten very tight with that because of the schedule, right? Like um, the band teacher has to cover this and do this and do that. Well, if we had enough band kids, we could hire a separate person to do band and do choir, or open up a schedule for them to offer more band electives. Um, drama, we share a drama program north to south. Um, computer science we were able to create an entire new position for that but we have our drive north to south for those things same thing with Gary Dale and industrial arts and so all of those things as you create flexibility it opens up all kinds of opportunities and some of those are ones we couldn't even predict right now um, it just depends on teacher and student interest um, we can really I feel like most of the public can feel it with athletics Right, like we can't feel the C team or we can't feel whatever, and all of a sudden, then it's like, oh, what, what kind of implications that has on the varsity level? Same things happen in classes. When you can't feel this class, then that kind of locks up all of these other things because you have to get this one class in, which then impacts all levels, right? Not just AP, but that teacher also teaches general classes, and they have to cover this prep period or they cover this lunch, and so um, we just are we're we're lean, we're lean and tight, which is great financially. Um, and so it's exciting to have ideas to maybe explore ways to give us just a little bit more breathing room for our, for our teachers and our students in that schedule. And speaking of efficiencies, even though the two teachers that we have that travel, um, not the best use of efficiency when they travel because then they lose a period that we could have them do something else and teach another class. And so that's one of the geographical challenges that we have too. 
because it's great to, to share and to be able to do that, but yet you are losing um, some teaching time because of travel. So, uh, I guess I would add too, as a curriculum guy, everybody always wants to promote the, the academics of it. Um, I think there's a lot of value from our athletic program, from our band program, from our industrial, like all of those programs help build kids. Um, and that's what we're in the business of. And so I hope, I hope we don't, it's not solely for the academics. Um, it's for raising good kids, good, well-rounded kids that can participate in sports and participate in their interests. And the more opportunities we give them, the more chances we are to connect with a kid and help them succeed. And that's really, I feel like, our, our, that's where our heart is. So what would the class size be, your estimate? Well, right now, just to give you an example, um, we had 134 students. I guess that may be, give you a little example. Like last year, we had 134 students graduated from North and South. South. Yeah. And I know that I've, it's been a long time since I've been in school, but I had 130 that graduated in my class. And so we're, we're really very close to um, what the class is part of it. And, and that was kind of a larger class. I mean, you could, if we went back to the one slide, you could see like back um, the year that had a thousand students, I mean, that, that was a, a large, um, obviously large classes there. They weren't always like that, but still that's, it's not very large. Um, and even comparing to schools around us, of course, there's a lot of schools that have a lot more students than that. Even the eight that we, if I think about those, you guys could probably help me a little bit too, be very comparable to, you know, Manchester, Wabash, McConaughey, Peru, um, Oak Hill, um, not Huntington, obviously. Right. Um, Oak Hill's uh, classes are getting bigger, probably more Wabash, Manchester. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Oh, actually higher than that. So they were capping up at 30 a class. And, and since I was there, they're, they're using the same schedule. Well, they just changed it. But for about 14 years, they used that same schedule. But they were having 50, I mean, 30 students in each section of each core class. So that's 150 students. So they were having 150 um, in each class for the most part. So they're, they probably average 130 to 150. So, and then of course, uh, uh, North Miami, uh, you know, smaller. Um, North Miami is comparable to one of our schools, uh, to Northwood, Southwood, separately right now. Um, Eastbrook, um, maybe a little smaller than that, but about the same also. So really, our neighboring schools that we touch are are about the same as um, our Northwood and Southwood high schools combined right now. So give or take one twenty-five to one fifty. Ish. And really our largest class right now is that seventh grade um, at Northfield with 90 students. And so, but then, <coughs> but then we also have, um, I'm doing this off memory, but we do have a couple of classes still in the 50s. One, and I think our senior class right now at Southwood is only 50 students. So you double that, that's only 100. Now, mm -hmm. that's a small, small class um, uh, within the, or throughout the corporation. But there's another one that's 50, and but yeah, 125 to 150. But typically, probably right around 130 is going to be where that will be over the next several years. I'd love to know what some of those guys were thinking too, I mean, <coughs> what their discussions were. I wonder if we could go back on Facebook Live or YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Well, if there's nothing else, we can close this meeting and get prepared for the next one, but we can still talk. Chris, our long-term debt goes completely off in 2023, Chris. And we've done that by choice, though, too. We could, have, we could have had it off before now, but we've made strategic spending decisions sure. yeah, to, to keep up with on Northfield and South. To keep up with some of our maintenance and yes. And upgrades on our facilities, we extended that debt by small chunks just right. to be able to. We always, well, lately we short term those length of debt so that we were in a position to be debt free. Mm -hmm. But we could have been debt free a year or two ago, mm -hmm. if I recall. Yeah. But we chose to keep improving Northwood and Southwood as the lead schools. Right. Right. There are bigger facilities. Yes. 
<clears throat> and especially south would be kind of an anchor in the southern, southern part of the county and district. Obviously, we're continuing to do that. We um, just finished up the roof at Southwood and then moved over to Northfield, so continue to work on that, which is mostly what this last bond was for, was for those roof repairs. Any other questions or comments? Or? Kevin definitely touches on an important part of it. Like it's not just the academic side of it, but it's also the financial investment and the future looking at all of it. The best way to spend money for the next 50 years as well, as far as buildings and roofs and sewage treatment plants and all that. And the projected assessed valuation is projected to go up, even though the you can look at that in two different ways, lights, favorably, but also it's ultimately it's a net tax bill, property tax bill. It's always encouraging to be in a growth assessed valuation. Then a decline. Then that definitely a decline. No, that's we should reiterate though that when that net gain or increase happens, we don't set property rates. That's <laughs> not our yeah. deal. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll continue to gather information and continue to report back you know, through some of these sessions and meetings. And sometimes we think it's we spent maybe too much time doing all the study, but it's a very, very important decision. So we're going to take um, our time, do it right, study, and the different information it's, it's great to know though too that you know we always want to encourage people that when we do have these different meetings and, and public presentations that they they come and share and obviously uh, we have open doors here at central office and, and the buildings too um, to ask questions when it comes down to it so a sidebar to all this is we hear in the news about COVID and so forth that there's been a, just a decline in public student numbers due to some of the feelings about all of that. I just wonder if that'll come back or if public education is still going to be competitive against more private education or home education. And so it's it's tough call for the future. But it is. You, you, you have to do something that puts yourself in a position that attracts mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. everything that you can possibly do. Mm -hmm. sure. right. We've been fortunate here, though, I feel like we've not been as impacted as maybe other areas in the state um, with all of that, but it's still a, a market that we need mm -hmm. to do better at. And become more efficient so that if that trend does continue, then we can do more with fewer students. Well, it, it's become such a consumer, somewhat mm -hmm. of a consumer environment. It's, it's though you and I decide where we're going to go get our groceries. So, we, you know, why go here versus here? Mm -hmm. Many choices now. Many choices. Certainly, since it's from other school districts that are finding ways to market what they offer and what they can provide. And so, it's certainly you're right, the competition area is beyond COVID. And our staff has done a great job um, knowing that, you know, we didn't, um, we weren't trained necessarily as educators to look at marketing and doing all those things, but we've really. I think turned a lot of corners to make sure that, we, that that's what we're doing and, and uh, making sure and, and even stepping up games, things like that. I think we've always have done that, but I think we kind of look internally a little bit more to say, what can we do to, to do better jobs and, and uh, with that? So there's a lot of things that you can do. But you have to have that in your mind too to know, okay, what can we do to help and making sure that 
uh, we provide the best opportunities for our students and, and the best education that we can. So. All right, well, we will close this meeting. Get it right there. Get it for board meeting. See you at six. <laughs> Same bad time.